we'd like to introduce today's um, guest, Ruben Wilcock. Now, Ruben works at Future Worlds at the university, and he also is managing director of Custom Ideas Limited, as well as bringing the project, the product, My Jolo, to market. So, Ruben, you were actually a student here at the university. What has changed the most since the time you were a student? Changed the most. So, I mean, a lot of things have changed. I came here in 1998. Yeah. Uh, I think different types of things have changed. So one of the things that's changed the most probably for me is physically the university, the shape of the university has yeah. changed. Down University Road, there used to be just rows of terraced red brick houses. Now obviously they've done loads and loads of buildings. Lots of buildings, yeah. We've got, you know, the uh, nursing midwifery building, life sciences. You're building every day, really. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of development. And so that's changed physically a lot. So most important question for our students, jesters. What's it still about when you were a student here? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Every single Friday. Uh, interesting story. So I did electronics. Yeah. Uh, all my friends would go there at one o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And, do it. and so what happened was I was stuck in the electronics labs doing my kind of, you know, Ooh. that kind of, kind of stuff. Missing and justice. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'd be sitting there desperately trying to finish, trying to get Tim Fawcett to sign off my book. And then I'd get on the bus, the Unilink bus about three o'clock, dash down there. My, my mates always had the table by the window, you know, the big table. I don't know if it's still there, and uh, had to play a bit of catch up. But yeah, clowns, jesters, did, always. Did they still sell jesticles back then? Always sell, sell jesticles. And how yeah. much were they? That, that's the key issue. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's a really, really good question. I think, um, yeah, I think they were five pounds. I think it five was pounds? five pounds. How much are they now? Three pounds now. Are they Ooh, three pounds yeah. now? I'm trying to remember. I think it was four pounds for. a Quad bod orange lemonade, which was uh, quite a popular choice. Don't have those anymore. They don't have those anymore. And they might do, but they call them. There's lots of different names because oh, yeah. of the juicy Lucy's, Jokers. So we definitely had juicy Lucy's. They're my yeah. favourite. So it's still going strong. Still, still very much going strong. Good, good to hear it. Good. Anyway, moving on from that. Like, I know that obviously you spent some time teaching, or well, you are spending time teaching here. And I know that you um, took on the role of disability mentor. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could tell me a bit of time about that. Yeah, so that was quite a long time ago. and. Um, and what happened was one of the academics, they kind of knew that I'd done very well. So it was when I was doing my PhD, I'd done very well in my undergraduate degree. Yeah. And they came up to me and said, oh, we've got this, this, this chap who needs a bit of help with his engineering maths. And so I agreed to, to help him and I got involved that way. And over the years, I, I helped quite a lot of students actually. And it's a really good thing because obviously if you've got a disability, whether it's a physical or, or another kind of disability, it's really important yeah. to be given the best you know, opportunity Absolutely, to, yeah. to maximise your potential. It's, it's very satisfying for me to do that. Brilliant. So we want to talk about one of your products here. So this is the, the Duo. I'll just get it out of the box so everyone can see. Looks a bit like a USB. Can you explain what it is in 15 seconds using no technical language? Okay. And we will stop you if there's anything we don't Some, understand. Something a GCSE student will understand. Okay, okay. So I, I think that's quite easy. It's quite a simple product. So Duo is given to you, to you by your energy companies free of charge. All you do is you press the button, you put it on your, to- on your thermostat for a week, okay, then, you, then you take the cap off, you plug it into your computer, you upload the results to their website, and it gives you personalised feedback on how to save energy and make your home more comfortable. Brilliant. Yeah, pretty good. That might have been 10 seconds, actually, I think. I think you did quite well, though. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll give you that. I, I think it might actually be more than 15 seconds. Oh, really? So. <laughs> okay. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> so, um, obviously, like, we've moved into second-year housing now, so we can see how this is really useful, but what was your particular like, inspiration behind this? So... What happened was, originally this was effectively a research tool. So I worked with a professor at the university who wanted to try and understand better how people use their central heating, uh, yeah. Alex Rogers. And it was really when I, I helped him develop the device for a research trial that I sort of thought, actually, you know, there's a commercial potential in this because energy companies really want to gain the trust and get into their customers' homes. And by giving this to, to customers for free, they could do that. It's almost like a Trojan horse. Yeah. So that was the inspiration. It was saying, look, well, here's a research tool but actually it's got commercial potential. So obviously it won the British Gas Award in 2013, I think. That's right. What do you think sets it apart? Like why, why do you think it particularly won that award? So the thing about Julia as a product, which I think helped us a lot, you know, when I went to that uh, competition, is that it's very simple. You know, you saw me talk yeah. about it in 10, 15 seconds and anything that you can get across very, very quickly like that, I think is, is great for those sorts of competitions. I think probably the reason why I had a good chance of winning that competition as I did just an insane amount of preparation for it. I mean, I, I researched every, every one of the companies, I think it was about 26 of the companies, you know, up to five people from me. I researched every single person that came before I went, all of the panel. So I was 100%, I knew who I was dealing with, you know, I knew exactly yeah. what to say to all of them. And that's what you really have to do if you want to have the best, best chance of winning these things. 
Well, just kind of get, get in with the judges is kind of what you're saying. So what you've got to do, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The night before, is at the press launch of Hive, which is uh, British Gas is a smart thermostat. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I was kind of laser targeting all the people I knew. I needed to, you know. <laughs> Buying a few drinks for people? <laughs> Definitely. Or drinks yeah. are flowing. So I only had to hear yeah. yeah, the judges sort of, you know, figuring out what, what, what Julia could bring to British Gas before the, before the day. Oh, brilliant. Now, we know that you sold the company, and I think it was to QB. So what made you to, uh, decide to do that? So, I mean, I think with all startups, it's quite a challenge during the stage where they must change from one thing to another, okay? So with Julo, we got it to the point, you know, we got it to this point, we got it yeah. to the point where we had the, we had the device, we, we had the marketing, we had energy companies wanting to trial the product, you know, they wanted to buy lots of these things, and we, we created the spin out, we've done the license agreements. And suddenly you're going from a company where you need to make, say, 500 or 1,000 or a few thousand of the things to potentially you've got to make a million devices, right? Correct. So that kind of point of scale is really, really difficult to decide what's the best way to do that. And lots of companies, startup companies, you know, you struggle when you when you go through growth growth periods. And so we had a, a period of time that we needed to capitalize on the interest, you know, in, in Julia. And it just felt the right thing to do at the time was to say, look, there's there's people out there that could do justice to this better now that we've got it to that stage. So that was really why we made that decision. So are you still involved in Julo now no. that you've it? Or no, is it totally step back now? Step back. So it's, it's what we call a clean break. So okay. what, what happens is that if it's quite a complicated company, you know, and you've got premises, you've got staff, you've got lots of ongoing projects, you'd no, nearly always be, it, you know, you need to work with that company that buys it for a while uh, because there's a lot of handover. Because Julo was a very self-contained proposition, it was quite straightforward, so it meant I could have a clean break. So That's you, quite good, that. Yeah. So do you miss those days at all, like working in Julo? That's a good question. I mean, there's, there's something to be said for, you know, just that every day, you know, huge amounts of work, just adrenaline, and you know exactly what you've got to do, and you know, massive focus on the goal, you know, and there's something yeah. about that that only like really that. entrepreneurs kind of experience, and it's like a drug, really. <laughs> so you just like those, you know, I mean, you do miss that feeling, yeah, a bit. So it's kind of, I mean, it's your baby. How far do you think you can go? Could it be a household name for energy in the future? Yeah, what, so, what do you I think? Mean, the, so the thing with Julo is that it really is, it's a self-contained uh, you know, opportunity, really. It's, it's the first step on the ladder. So the idea is, you know, energy companies can send this to their customers. And what it gives them is it gives, gives them a foot in the door. Okay? And that's really what it always was. It was a nice, self-contained proposition. Uh, so in terms of getting a lot bigger by its own, it's probably quite unlikely, but it's a great way for companies to get in the door of, of energy companies, their customers. Okay. I mean, I know we were really impressed with you. Yeah, I just, just looking at it, it's almost a simple idea that seemed to do so much. And we, well, obviously, we, we come again from the <laughs> not tech based view, so it's probably yeah. a lot more complicated than we think. But on the surface of it, it's very easy to understand. Yeah, so some of the algorithms that were running, I mean, that was really the clever, smart part, was that although the device itself, it was just recording yeah. temperature, really. And then what we did was we used existing weather data servers to get the temperature from outside your house at the same time. But what we did with the algorithms was to take all of that data and just infer clever stuff from it. And that was where the, the real intelligence was. Okay. So Ruben also works at FutureWorlds here. So well, can you explain that to us in under 15 seconds? Same again. Okay, so, yeah. so Future Worlds, right, is an ecosystem which pulls together all of the pieces, all the components, all the mentors, advisors you need to make your spin-up startup a big success. And what's your main goal then for Future Worlds? Have you got like a, is there a mission statement? Yeah, so there is a mission, right? But I mean, this really stems from having read about places like Stanford, okay? So Stanford University, yeah. You yeah. might not know, but there's, I think there's about 40,000 okay, active companies that can trace their roots to Stanford University. Well, there you go then. Do you know that if you, if you took all of those companies, if they created an independent nation, they'd be the 10th biggest nation in the world, right? <laughs> That's impressive. Now that's what a startup culture is, and so the goal of Future Worlds is to create that kind of startup culture here. And it's going to take time, but that's what we're going to try and get to. So, how are you building this ecosystem? How are we? How are you trying to make Southampton a new Stanford, so to speak? So, I think what I've identified is the main thing that we, I suppose, we haven't been doing very well here is to pull together all of the people, the advisors, the investors, the experts, the mentors, those types of people, in a really, really meaningful way, and connect those to the aspiring entrepreneurs that come along. So what's really behind at the core, I suppose, of Future Worlds is that network. And we're spending a lot of time and effort bringing them in, interviewing them, just like you are, me today. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, and making those accessible to the, the entrepreneurs that come through our doors. 
Yeah, it's like Future Worlds again seems like a really good idea. Like so again, something simple that just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. No, it's. I mean, I, I guess what it is is it's saying look, there's lots of different things that make a startup a success. Yeah, but let's bring it all together in one place and let's make it really, really compelling, really high quality, and uh, and make it available to everyone. That's good. So I know we have a couple of uh, your other products here today. So maybe you want to talk us through a couple of them. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I've had an interesting journey with the products. I'd say some of them. I mean, this is probably. Let me think. This is probably one of the one of the first ones. Um, just very simple things. But you have to learn a lot doing doing this sort of, this sort yeah. of process. This is just a, a third party download cable for scuba diving computers that look a bit like that. Uh, and we've sold you know, thousands and thousands of those. But this was the first piece of injection molding that I did. This little piece here. And I had to talk, teach myself how to do that kind of thing. The product that really uh, kind of got my company started, which yeah. I set up when I did my PhD, uh, was this one, which is the Geopic 2. And this was actually the first geotagging device for DSLR cameras at the time. Uh, and I got a patent on it. So it was the first time you could put this on top of a camera, a DSLR Nikon camera, and every time you took a picture, you could, you'd could, you know exactly where it was taken, like a GPS yeah. locus. And when I got my kind of big break, when, when the sort of company suddenly changed direction, was when this was picked up by the world's biggest photographic retailer in the States, which is called B&H Photo Review. So they were suddenly ordering in boxes and boxes of these things. So we kind of think that as sort of standard nowadays, but it's yeah. interesting to see to know actually where that I comes mean, from. I mean, it's been a really short period of time. So this is about 10 years ago, and you know nobody yeah. was really doing it. And there was just a small, you know, it was really the, the amateur and sort of slightly more than amateur photography community that desperately wanted geotagging devices. It was like the biggest and most exciting thing. And now every phone has one. Every phone is built into them, which is why, I mean, so we don't sell this anymore, but you know, we did, we did very well out of this. I suppose the next question is obviously you've got something like that, you've got the USB cable, you've got the Julo, and this is the Viper, which is uh, light for caving. Light for caving, yeah. Why is that, why did you come up with so many different ideas? How does it happen with all this diversity? Yeah, it's, it's quite strange. I mean, I suppose if you looked at it, you, you could say, well, you know, on the one hand I've done you know, physical products like this, yeah. you know, of all kinds of different sizes and shapes. Uh, on the other hand, you know, very, very low cost, very high volume consumer products. And now we're doing Future Worlds, which isn't a product at all, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a service. And, and I think really what it comes down to is I'm one of those people that looks around and I will spot just stuff that I think needs to be done better all the time, you know, and it, it is almost a disease, you know. <laughs> I look at things like these lights and I just think, God, you know, that stand is terribly made. And so it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter whether it's a product, physical product, a service, you know, anything like that. I look at it and I just think, God, someone's got to do this better. So then I just launch, and I love a challenge. So I just want to launch myself at it and see how I can. So you kind of always you launch yourself at problems and try and find a solution. Yeah, I launch myself at a problem. Or it might not be a problem, but it might just be a, you know what? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could make what is normally a rubbish looking light that you stick on top of your caving hat and you actually make it out of a block of solid aluminium, you know, and you anodize it like, you know, those mag light torches and you laser etch the, you know, it's that kind of thing where you say, look, let's go totally overboard and make this the very best it could ever be. And that for me is, is, is you know, what motivates me, I suppose. How do you feel like looking back on the products and seeing the ones that you know, have become a, quite a massive success? Yeah, it's good. I mean, I, I, I'm always striving for the next thing. So I'm actually one of those people that always, I'm not really happy with anything ever. You know, I'm always thinking I want to do the next, I want to do it better, I want to do, I wish I could have done that differently. Um, but when you do lay it out on the table, like we have here, down here, you sort of think, well, actually, that's, that's quite impressive. I mean, these things were sold all over the world. We still sell some of them. You know, some of them are potentially being made in millions of, of quantities now for, for the energy companies. So it's really nice to see it there and, and reflect back on that. Well, if you're looking for a new challenge, there's some sort of tech to make our housemates do the washing up would probably be quite useful, I think. I can tell you, I've got experience with that. It's never going to happen. <laughs> okay. I'm right. you can't solve. I'm slowly accepting it. It's taken me almost a year, but I'm almost there. But I'm, I'm fighting so. <laughs> Keep fighting. <laughs> So I presume you've obviously pitched to a lot of people. How would you feel pitching someone like Lord Sugar or even Claude Littler? Like, what do you think they would say? Yeah, so I mean, for me, I don't pitch anything. I try not to put myself in a position where I pitch anything that I don't believe in, okay? So whether it's a product, whether it's, a service, whether it's something like Future Worlds, whether it's something like, you know, Julo, to any companies, I, I won't even go into the room unless I really believe in it. And if I do really believe in it, then normally my passion for it comes across. And that's really what people are looking for, I think. So how would I feel about pitching to Lord Sugar? It, it actually wouldn't bother me any more than pitching to the head buyer of you know, some big company I'm trying to get into. I don't really attach 
different level of importance for people yeah. just because of their, you know, standing in that world. So it's been a couple of years now since you won the Royal Engineering um, Academy Award. Yeah. How is that kind of, is that open doors? Do you kind of get like, to go around and be like, I'm better than you? Are people, people on <laughs> campus? How does that feel? Yeah, it, it's not quite like that. Um, but I no. think we know that we, well, you would definitely flaunt that if I was you. <laughs> I would. Yeah, so I mean, I do, they did give me a very nice um, picture for the wall. That was good. Uh, Royal Academy of Engineering Entrepreneur Award. And the one thing I'd say that, so that's a really prestigious organisation, the Royal Academy of Engineering. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're right next to the Royal Society in London. They've got a lovely um, Prince Philip house. And they've created this thing called the Enterprise Hub. And the Enterprise Hub is something that, that actually we took a lot of inspiration from the future worlds. So one of the nice things that's come as a side effect of winning that award is that you get invited to all of their events and you get to network and you get to, you know, see all these fascinating things that are happening. And I've, I've benefited enormously from that kind of network. So. Yeah. Well, I think the question that everyone is dying to hear is, I mean, how do you have time to eat and sleep? Yeah. Uh, just, just generally do other things. Yes, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Basically don't. Uh, this is a bad time to ask me that question because it's been very, very busy with, with Future Worlds recently. Um, this isn't a good thing, all right? So I have, a, I have basically an unhealthy obsession with, with work. You can talk to my wife about it. She's, so I have a very supportive <laughs> wife, which is great. And she, you know, Probably she's, quite she's, necessary. She's brilliant. I wouldn't be able to do it, do it without her. Uh, but it is, so if you ever ask any entrepreneur this sort of question, you know, what sacrifice have you made, that kind of thing, you will see the pain in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it many, many times. And it is literally, you just see them drift off to another, because they just remember just what they've given up and the nights and the dogs. And the truth is, is that when you're really embedded in doing a project, you know, something that you really believe in, that you're trying to get to that end goal, and it's, you're working, you know, 14, 15 hour days, you're doing it every day of the week. It's just, it's, it's like a drug and it is not healthy, you know. <laughs> but when you get to the end, the satisfaction is huge. So the last question I think we're going to ask is, what is the one proudest moment of your professional career? If you could pick just one, Only what would one. it be? And just off the yeah. top of your head, what first comes to mind? Okay, off the top of my head, it's definitely selling Julo, selling the company Julo. It's the first time I'd, I'd really sold a company in that way, and it was loads of work, and by the end of it, it was just me that did it, and so it was a massive achievement. Right, brilliant. Well, thank you for talking for us today. Thank you. I'm sure all our viewers would have really um, enjoyed and been interested by what you've had to say. It's been an absolute pleasure. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. So, this is probably the last time we'll be filming in the Future World studio, so we'd like to thank them very much for letting us sort of like muck around in front of the camera and also to Alex who has filmed us and edited us if you just want to pop around the camera come on, come come on, come on, on Alex face. we love Alex Alex is brilliant <laughs> <laughs> it's not our decision to have lost to lose, be losing Alex so that's come from above our head and we're not too happy about it but Ooh. we'll see <laughs> anyway um, starting next week we'll be filming with Susu TV and we'll be reviewing a student, um, a student an app to make a student's life easier and one just for fun so we are very much looking forward to working with Susu TV if you haven't yet, could you, then please follow us on Twitter at, at uni underscore TechBite and also like the ECS Entrepreneurs Facebook page. Thank you very much for listening. This has been TechBite. Goodbye.